hey guys, the reason that I'm um, including a video blog with this is because I think that the figures that are below are much better explained in uh, video format rather than just uh, writing something out. I also think that everyone should look at these figures on their own, see what you think. Uh, I don't exactly want my opinions to sway you too much if, if you want to look at these yourself and, and see what you think. Um, because there's a million different ways to look at it and what I'm just going to share are some of my notes uh, that I took regarding this and um, it, it basically was inspired by Jason's article Super Bowl titles and high salary quarterbacks and what he was alluding to there was maybe it's not the best idea to go out and pay Jay Cutler uh, millions of dollars uh, or some other Middle of the road quarterback, like teams have been doing, there are mil there are a dozen different ways to construct a Super Bowl team, as seen by these figures. Uh, I got these from ProFootballReference.com. Um, when you're looking at each of these teams, what was interesting to me was in the late '90s, there seemed to be a, the the teams that won the Super Bowl were all very very dominant. Um, it, for instance, the 1996 Packers were number one and number two in points offensive. I mean, number one on offense and number one on defense in points. Um, and starting around 2000, we began to see teams that weren't number one in points on offense or weren't number one in points on defense. Um, when you look at the 2001 Patriots, they were they were kind of a middle of the road team in terms of. In terms of the, the yards they gave up, somehow um, those yards didn't turn into points. They were sixth in offensive ranking and defensive ranking in points. And I think that what this kind of stuff alludes to and how to construct these teams now and how to construct teams overall was with the fact that Steve Young was the highest um, paid quarterback in terms of the percentage of the salary cap he took up and only three other quarterbacks, uh, both Mannings, um, Manning in 2011, Eli in 2011, and Man uh, Peyton in 2006, and Favre in 1996, is that what we what we should look at is how to construct a complete team. Uh, with some teams spending, uh, you know, the Packers spending the amount of money they do on Aaron Rodgers. Um, while Aaron Rodgers is a great quarterback, when you're worth a hundred million dollars, it's not it's not like Ray Lewis said. Uh, when he was speaking to this point in, in September, I think he was, when he was talking about Andy Dalton getting a big deal, is that some of the other positions, the top players at linebacker, aren't making that mid-range quarterback money. Like Andy Dalton, it, as nice a kid as Andy Dalton might be, is he worth $100 million? And obviously his, his contract is a bit incentive-laden, um, but when you're looking at these the, the structure of a team, are teams doing it the right way when they're looking to, to go out and get a guy who they think is going to throw for 4,000 yards and probably isn't going to anyway? When a lot of these Super Bowl teams didn't throw for 4,000 yards, they were good running teams. They were good passing teams. They scored a lot of points, yes. They, 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 they had great defenses too, though. And to, to properly construct a team, something that um, I spoke about in the last article I put up regarding the final four teams, the Colts, the Packers, the Patriots, and the Seahawks, is that they're doing things the right way. That's why they made it this far. Obviously, this, the, the Colts were without Robert Mathis uh, this year. They're, I think he would have been their biggest cap charge. And, and what you got to look at is putting your money in the passer, yes, but also putting your money in the guy that protects the passer, the left tackle, um, the people who catch the ball, yes, but also the people who stop the uh, the pass and the people who rush the pass, mainly the the pass rushers, obviously, and the cornerbacks, and and that's why the Seahawks are so good is that they had great corners, they had a great quarterback for their system. It was obviously a run first system. They do spend a lot of money on their running back, but with, with the amount of money they were able to save by drafting well, they had the top uh, defensive backfield for not a lot of money. And one of the top quarterbacks, as it turns out, from a production standpoint in Russell Wilson, for not a lot of money as well. When you look at these figures, what Jason and I are, are kind of alluding to is that you have to have a complete team to win the Super Bowl. If you look at the averages, um, obviously they are averages of all the Super Bowl teams, but they're not in the top 10 even for most of these yardage. Um, uh, defensive 
if you look at the averages, the defense does look like it it, it does have a li little bit more of a slant in that um, the defensive rankings are a little bit higher than the offensive rankings. But point differential, unsurprisingly, is one of the biggest indicators of a Super Bowl champion with them being the average Super Bowl champion being ranked fifth in the NFL in the point differential, winning by an average of nine points per game. And two, a, a few teams that stuck out to me, though, when you are speaking to the quarterback argument, is that the 2006 Colts and the 2011 Giants, those same two Eli Manning and Peyton Manning teams um, that, that Jason uh, talked about being over that 10% salary cap, is that they they were carried by two quarterbacks that had great years uh, with with Peyton ha uh, being the their their passing offense being the second highest in the NFL and Eli Manning in 2011 throwing for almost 5,000 yards. The, there was only, all, there's only been one number one passing team in the the salary cap era to win the Super Bowl. That was the 1999 Rams. An interesting point about them: their second leading receiver was Marshall Falk, a running back. So they were able to um, win win with, yes, the passing game, but they did it in a way that it was kind of like a running game. And Marshall Falk was running a lot of a lot of short passes out of the backfield, had over 1,000 receiving yards, and did have over 1,300 rushing yards. And what, you, what you'll see here with some of the teams that aren't great offenses is almost every single one of them had the number one defense. Uh, those being the 2000 Ravens, the 2002 Bucks, the 2003 Patriots, the 2008 Steelers. Interestingly, in both of uh, Big Ben's Super Bowl years, he wasn't uh, uh, high, didn't have a lot of yards passing those years. Uh, did have good running backs. Um, in, if you look at figure number four, um, those 2008 Steelers did get a lot of production out of Willie Parker and Moel De Moore. In 2005, Willie Parker had, I think that was his breakout year. He had over 1,200 rushing yards and over 200 receiving yards. And another interesting fact about those 2,000 Ravens, when you look at the way the Seahawks have constructed their team, and what we do a lot of the times at Over the Cap is try to figure out the best way to construct a, a Super Bowl team or a winning team uh, when looking at uh, the salary cap for each team and and what I think each team individually has to do for a lot of you guys that are going to do our GM series uh, the team building um, that, that's that been talked about on the site the last few days I'm not I forget the exact name but it's going to be an interesting thing to see everyone look at these rosters and try to figure out what first off what's your team what's your coach want to do I'm about to write an article about how the Browns are actually in a great position um, to build off of, I think, Manziel and, and his strengths as a player. But obviously they have a new offensive coordinator coming in, and that's a big decision for them if they're going to stay with Manziel or they're going to go elsewhere. Uh, bringing in a guy who is he going to work with Manziel and construct something that, that will help him succeed. Because I think the Browns are in a good position to follow the Seahawks model with a, 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 quick, a quick runner. A, a, if you look at Manziel, I, I, I know he was in the air raid offense, uh, and Wilson was in a, in a professional style offense at, at both NC State and Wisconsin. When you look at their roster, I know Isaiah Kroll and I know um, Terrence West didn't have fantastic years, but they got a great O line. Um, they have a, a quarterback similar to Russell Wilson. He needs to get his head in the game and and, and act like Russell Wilson. Obviously, uh, obviously Josh Gordon's out again this year. Uh, I, I, I don't understand it. Uh, very disappointing uh, to see someone that talented be out. Um, but with the with the Seahawks model, they have a good defense. They, they could have a great defense. And, and another thing I'll put in the links below uh, is that ESPN article that they just came out with, how far away is each team. And the Browns are only about, they say, about five to seven, I think, players away from being a Super Bowl contender. And I don't disagree with that. Uh, I do disagree with their analysis that Manziel is a failed project already. You just spent a first-round pick. I don't see anyone uh, wasting a first-round pick that quickly. Uh, I know he had his issues. But when you look at um, his talents and what he can do, they're in a good position to, to, to have the Seahawks model. When you look at the 2000, 2000 Ravens, it, it's something that the, the Seahawks seem to kind of um, try to create with their team. Great defense. 
um, a run first scheme with Marshawn Lynch. Those 2000 Ravens had Jamal Lewis and Priest Holmes. They combined for about 2,400 total yards. And you see with Tom Brady, the way that he understands uh, from the from the high paid quarterback route, he understands and the and the Patriots understand these figures and understand that having while the 2006 Colts their passing game did um, cover up some, a lot of their inefficiencies. They were 23rd or they were 18th in rushing. They were last in the league in rush defense and. A great quarterback can cover up some of those issues, but you're going to need a complete team if you want a better shot at winning the Super Bowl. And Brady understands that moving forward by reconstructing his contract this year so that they had money, hopefully, for them to, to re-sign guys like Revis, guys like Green. While, while we do kind of um, speak against the second deal for running backs, especially with all the wear and tear. A guy like Vereen, a pass catcher first, um, he, he would be a good investment for them. He doesn't have a lot of um, wear and tear. He has missed quite a few games, but they were with wrist injuries and, and things of that nature. So he's really only had about two and a half full seasons, I think, in the NFL. If they sign him to a four-year deal, that's not a bad deal. They did sign Kevin Falk continually throughout his career. Um, and that that worked out for them. Kevin Falk was a major part of that Super Bowl run. And Shane Vereen, like I said in that Patriots Way article, um, they, they do construct a team that is like their past Super Bowl champion teams. And when you look at the, the figures below, if you look at figure number three, and when we're talking about the quarterback values, it's obvious that you don't need the best quarterback in the NFL to win the Super Bowl. While these guys are a lot of the bigger name guys, a lot of Hall of Famers, Steve Young, Troy Aikman, Brett Favre, John Elway, Kurt Warner, even Tom Brady, the seasons they had were not mind-blowing by any stretch. In the current, in fact, in the current... Averages when you look at the averages of quarterback passing in figure in figure three again, fourteen quarterbacks this year threw for over the average yards and thirteen threw for over the average TDs. Now I do know that in recent years uh, passing numbers have exploded, but if you look at the the uh, the last three quarterbacks to win, Eli Manning, Joe Flacco, and Russell Wilson, they're not they're not. Aaron Rodgers, and they're not, I know Aaron Rodgers won in 2010. They're not Peyton Manning. One thing I've seen with this, while Peyton Manning has probably been the best quarterback statistically of the last decade and a half, because of that, partially because of that, they have had to pay him that like that. And that's something that I, I saw when looking at this what, that made me realize maybe it's not that Peyton Manning's a bad playoff quarterback. Maybe it's that He's been paid such a high percentage of his team's salary cap for so long that he hasn't been on these complete teams. When you look at the teams Brady's been on that have won, um, in two thousand in two thousand three, they had the best defense in the NFL, and in two thousand seven, on that perfect season, they had a great defense. And the reason why I've been analyzing their two thousand seven team because they're the only perfect regular season team of the salary cap era. Part of the reason why they were so good that year was because they had arguably the best passing attack in NFL history in Brady, Moss, Dante Stallworth, Wes Welker. Brady, the quarterback position that year, only took up 7.4% of their salary cap. Their wide receiver position only took up 9.4% of their salary cap. When you look at the NFL averages of today, the average NFL team, those are both below the average percentage that... That the NFL spends on those two positions. And by having such low cap numbers, it allowed them to go out and have one of the best uh, defenses in the league that year. I, if, I'm, if I'm not mistaken, um, their defense was the best uh, in the league that season. And it's just, it's interesting to look at the main questions that get brought up by some of these articles that we write. Because I think I've said this, but 
a lot of the articles we write here should raise questions. They, there should be an offshoot of questions to be answered, and that's what Jason's article on Super Bowl titles and high salary quarterbacks did for me. Uh, and, and an example of some of the questions that it raised for me was, how can a team get this Super Bowl production of these teams? Understanding with the, with the current uh, quarterback, the way quarterbacks are performing, maybe you should look at just the past few years. But even then, in 2008, not that long ago, Big Ben didn't have a, a, a mind-blowing season. It's about constructing this complete team with a, a great defense. And, and you look at the 2012 Ravens. Good defense. Uh, that, that's one thing about the Ravens the past few years. They've been built for the playoffs. And that's why in January they've been so so good. Uh, why you look at them, they have this year's team was very similar to that 2012 team. With that CJ Mo, with drafting CJ Mosley has set them up to have a similar defense that they had with Ray Lewis. CJ Mosley is going to be one of the best linebackers in the NFL for a, a long time, and they're another team just like the just like the Patriots uh, and just like the Seahawks right now that they know what worked for them in the past and they construct a roster in that manner. So. It's about how can a team get that production for the least amount of money and how can teams best replicate these stats shown on these tables from a salary cap standpoint. Uh, what percentages? Uh, I think that's something that Jason and I did a good job of. St uh, st I'm not sure if anyone else had done this yet, but we both started looking at, rather than the numbers, we started looking at the percentages the teams uh, spent on each position in regards to their salary cap. And I think that's the right way to look at it, considering the salary cap changes every year every year, and looking at the percentages, uh, looking at the stats, that, uh, looking at the, the production that you're going to try and get, and as seen by the two coaches that are left, the two Super Bowl coaches, um, having great coaches. Uh, I heard Andre Carter on Joey Diaz's podcast, he's a comedian, but Andre Carter, who was on the Patriots team, part of what makes the Patriots so great is the, continu uh, the continuity, uh, I just messed up that word, sorry, uh, the continual... Uh, of this, the, the staff staying together for all these years, the coaches know each other. Um, they they know what they they know what they're trying to do. They know um, how they're trying to construct a team. And these great teams understand the the right salary cap, um, per, what they need from a salary cap standpoint, the kind of running back they need, like like the Patriots having Vereen and um, uh, Kevin Falk in the past, knowing what worked for them. Uh, the, the Seahawks, if you're going to have that great defense, a lot of the great defenses also had great running games. When you look at the 2000, uh, the 2000 Ravens, they had the number one defense and they had the number five rushing, rushing uh, attack. So when you look at figure four, um, I don't want to have this be too long. I, these are just the notes of it. Um, you look at figure four and the best running back on each of these teams Averaged about 1,500 total yards, averaged over 1,100 yards rushing, was about 4.4 yards per carry, did have almost 40 catches. So that that's obviously a, an important part of the offense more and more every year. And you saw that I think Marshall Falk was kind of a revolutionary running back in the way he did that. He had 87 catches that 1999 season. A uh, big reason why they, they were so good, why they were the greatest show on turf. And you look at the a lot of these running backs had prominent backups uh, in years where guys like Terrell Davis and, and in years where guys had over 2,000 total yards. Um, obviously, the backup's not going to get as much burn. Obviously, he's not going to have the same kind of statistical output. But, you know, that, that 2,000 Ravens team, it, it was constructing those teams in the right way. Having the Jamal Lewis with 1,600 yards, but if you're going to be a running team, you have to have a great backup, and they obviously did with Priest Holmes. Um, the Corey Dillon 2004 Patriots uh, with Kevin Falk having 500 total yards as the backup. Uh, just all, a lot of interesting things to look at for yourself and, and come up with your own thoughts on it. And uh, what I was looking at also is the top two receiver averages in figure number five. With... You look at the teams that had 12 wins this year, and even the teams with 11 wins this year. Packers had Nelson and Cobb, Broncos, Thomas and Sanders, Demarius. 
uh, Cowboys, Bryant and Witten, uh, Lions, uh, Golden Tate and Calvin Johnson, Steelers, uh, Antonio Brown and Le'Veon Bell. Uh, again, they were like the 1999 um, Rams, where their running back was their second leading receiver. And then the Colts had Hilton and Wayne. Obviously, Wayne had a, a difficult end of the season with all the injuries. But a lot of the great teams have two great receivers, uh, whether they be running backs, receivers, or tight ends. So, again, something to look at. And something interesting also about the Seahawks is their manner of building the salary cap when they realized that Percy Harvin didn't really have a role for them anymore. They just got rid of him. They didn't need him. He was too much money. Found the Jets. And while I liked the deal for the Jets at the time, and I still do because they can they can tell him, you're not going to go out and get a big contract. We're going to restructure your deal. You can either like it or you can be cut. I do like what the Seahawks did, and, and the Jets took a one-year flyer on him and told him to prove it. And the problem with Percy Harvin is he can't stay healthy, and I don't think he'll ever be able to prove it um, because he won't be able to stay healthy for all these years. Um but the Seahawks don't need a guy like that. They need a, a, a Doug Baldwin, who's actually an, a, a great blocker as well. He's, one, he's the, according to Pro Football Focus, he's the 17th best run blocking wide receiver in the, in the NFL. And Golden Tate was 109th this year. So they, they gave Doug Baldwin an extension. Golden Tate was going to cost too much. They let him go. Maybe if Percy Harvin wasn't on the roster, they would have re-signed Tate. And imagine how good this team would have been then. But, you know, they let him go. And they got what they needed out of Doug Baldwin and Jermaine Curse. Something interesting about the Patriots, Rob Gronkowski, he's the first leading receiver for potentially for a Super Bowl champion since uh, as a tight end since Shannon Sharp in 2000 with the Ravens. Um, he The most similar receiver to him as a number one receiver is Marquez Colson in 2009 in recent years. Um, he, Marcus Colson's also very good in the slot, which, uh, if you look at, I'll try and find this article, but if you look at Gronk's production in the slot, he's, uh, very good in the slot. He's, he's very good out wide as well because he's just a matchup nightmare. Uh, uh, another thing that I spoke about in that creativity and confusion article I wrote a few, a few months back and Bill Belichick is one of the best in the NFL at creating creativity and confusion. Um, out of various formations, the stuff he did in that game against the Ravens, the new formations have opened the door to uh, an entirely new kind of football. Uh, there was a great article, I think, in the Boston Globe that I'll also link below. Um, it's about creating uh, confusion with creativity, and the Patriots are one of the best in the NFL at that. And that's why they don't need to go out and get the, the prototypical number one receiver they, they did get a great number one receiver that was undervalued in Brandon LaFell. They did want Emmanuel Sanders, uh, but Brandon LaFell has been perfect for them and is, is relatively cheap at $3 million a year. But for the last few years, they've had they've been great with a, a, a non, non-prototypical number one receiver in a Julian Edelman and, and a Wes Welker, and that's why they went out and got Danny Amendola, who, yes, while his contract is a bit high, uh, fits the offense well and has done well in the playoffs. For that reason. Um, lastly, uh, figures number six and number seven. Uh, something interesting that, uh, that I put together is the importance of the running back on a winning percentage for uh, during the regular season. If you look at the, the thousand yard rushers from 2014 uh, back to 2010, uh, these teams that had a thousand yard rusher had a 550 winning percentage. And the teams that didn't have a thousand yard rushers had a uh, three hundred uh, a three six seven winning percentage. So there's obviously become a correlation. Uh, there's obviously a correlation between running the ball well and winning the, winning the game winning games. Um, so you know, just a, something that I thought. These are just my notes on this. I, I hope you got something out of this video. Uh, as always, my PayPal donation link is, is below. If you find that you that I create some value for you, uh, send a dollar, send two dollars. Uh, I, I want to do this full time. So as as much money as I can create through this, it would be great. So um, again, you can tweet me at Zach Moore NFL and uh, let me know what you think about this article there or in the comments, uh, the comment section of the article uh, I post. 
So thanks, guys, and have a great Super Bowl weekend.